God, we thank you, we honor you, we give you the praise this morning, amen, and we go welcome the man of God to give us a word, amen. 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 amen, thank you, I mean, that was awesome, I'm serious, Gary woke up on the right side of the bed this morning, amen. you know, you know, so we always say, I woke up on the wrong side, he, he woke up with intent, I love that, I love that so much, you know, now, I, you, you, you know, I, I, he already had had y'all hype and everything, and I love that. But I, you know, me, I'm, I'm real funny. I found that I saw this joke that I just had to share with you. I don't know. I might have shared it with Toya. Why? But this is funny. There was a lady named Mildred, the church gossip and self-appointed um, arbiter of the church morals. She kept sticking her nose in the other the other members' private lives. Church members were unappreciative of her activities, but feared her enough to maintain the silence. She made a mistake, however, when she accused George, a new member, of being an alcoholic after she saw his pickup truck parked in, front, parked in the front of the town's only bar one afternoon. She, committed, she, she commented to George and others that everyone seeing it there would know what he was doing. George, a man of few words, stared at her for a moment and just walked away. He didn't explain, defend, or deny his, or, and, he did, and he said nothing. Later that evening, George quietly parked his pickup truck in front of Mildred's house and left it there all night. <laughs> I, 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 I read that when it, it made me laugh because I was thinking about how we always judge a situation, not knowing everything that's going on. And, and, we, beca and we begin to make our, ourselves self-appointed experts on what we see. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, I know what I see. I know what I know. So that's what it is. And then we want to hold other people accountable to our knowledge of what we believe. And then we wonder why we don't have peace in our life. Because hmm. see, the thing with that lady Mildred, she had to be a bitter old soul. I mean, I'm just saying, I, I, I was always taught, you know, when people like that, you know, they got their own personal issues, so they're trying to deflect it on someone else. And then we got to ask ourselves, are we that person? You know, and I know that we're um, in the series of teaching on vision, but God wanted me this week to deter from that because um, he's, from what we've been dealing with and what I've been seeing for the past few weeks, it has illuminated something that we've been dealing with within our culture. And I mean within the United States, and that's pain. That's hurt. And one of the hardest things to move on in life is when you have hurt and pain, okay? And when I mean pain, I mean that deep inside pain, not just a stub your toe pain. But you ever had a pain that every now and then, that it stops you from what you're doing? You know, you have a pain that goes up your spine, and no matter what you're doing, you just stop and be still. A pain in your leg that just shuts you down. Sometimes it can just be a headache. I know I've had some headache pains that it just shut me completely down. I was just like, you know, I'm done. I'm not, I can't move. I don't, I don't want to get out of bed. I've had pain. I had one headache bad, so bad. You ever had a headache so bad that you wake up with it in the morning, you want to go to go back to sleep, but it hurts so bad you can't even go back to sleep. You don't want to hear the phone ring. Even the ticking of the clock is too loud for you. I mean, and, I, and the thing is, you try to find out what is the root of the pain. And what, what do we normally do when we have pain? We take, we take medicine. But does medicine cure that pain? No. It numbs the pain. It, it dis, hear what I'm about to tell you. What that medicine does is the same thing we do with our painful situation. It disconnects the nerves from flowing to letting you know there's pain. In other words, it numbs it. So therefore, the pain, whatever the pain causing the pain is still there. But now that nerve is numb, it's paralyzed. So you don't feel it. But whatever it is, it's still there. The problem is still there. But what begins to happen is, through time, we keep going through the motions and going through the motions, and whatever the injury is, whatever that is, is building up and building up and building up. And we don't ever get to the root of it. But then we, and then we begin to realize, well, the root of it is not me, it's someone else. But Paul teaches us something different, to be honest with you. The nature of our pain always goes back to us. If you turn with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 
You know, preachers always say, when you have it, say amen. You know, one day I'm going to put it to a test with a young crowd versus an older crowd and see who says amen first. Okay. You know, since old folk claim they know the Bible so much, but young folk, you know, they use electronics. I want to see who gets there first. You know, so, so you still, hear, you know, we still hear pages turning, pages turning. Everybody else, you know, they got it already on their phone. They, they, they wait, they wait, they wait. But it says, um, we're going to start in verse 1. I love it. It says, therefore, since we have th these promises, dear friends, and I'm reading out of the NIV, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Make room, in your, make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. I've spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. You know, you, Paul has said a lot of good stuff here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Make it feel good. Amen. Be careful. <laughs> When people start telling you all the good things, because you got to know Paul. Paul, Paul is whenever he writes his introduction to his letters, the thing he does is he wants to set a precedent so you don't close the book. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna tell you, if you want to go off on somebody or chastise somebody, don't don't go off on them first. Be real, real nice to them so they open their mind and they're receptive. You know, people always say, "I'm trying to, I'm trying to talk to someone, but they mad and they're not here." I said, first thing you tell them, tell them, say, "Hey, listen, hey, I love you." You know. All is good. Greetings. I said, and then they're receptive. That don't just slam them. And Paul is doing this. He says, for we came into Macedonia. We had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside. Fears within. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by, coming, by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you have given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I, here we go, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to your repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, so we are not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point have proved yourself to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of one who did the wrong nor on the account of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. Now, this morning, I just want to deal with you on the topic of God uses pain to bring out peace. God uses pain to bring out peace. I know that sounds real crazy. You know? We don't want to hear anything like that. But here's what I want you to understand. What happened here, Paul wrote a letter saying, listen, I know your feelings got hurt by what I said. I know you were chastened. And, and, and one of the things we, ha we have a problem within, a, with, within our society is we want the mediator to take sides. You ever notice that? We want somebody to take my side or take their side. Paul did this. He said, I'm not taking a side. He says, both of you all are wrong. Because both of you all feel that you all are, that each other is the problem, when the problem lies within. One of the things we have to understand with our hurt is the fact that God has allowed us to go through such pain. God has allowed us to go through such pain. 
I was speaking with someone yesterday and they were bothered and they, some things didn't go right for them. And I asked them a simple question. I said, did God tell you to do this or did you tell yourself? And I say that because I have to ask myself that question when I go through. Is this God's vision or is this Jean's vision? Because if it's God's vision, then anything that comes from here on, God has control of and knows what knew it was going to happen. Are you? Am I making sense here? Mm -hmm. We sit back and we worry and we stress. You know, God, it rained. God, this happened. God, people didn't show up. God, I didn't get the money. God, the check didn't clear. You know, all these different things. God, you gave me you gave me the job, but I didn't have gas. God, I, the, the closing didn't happen. And, and you fail to realize, did God send you through this? Are you walking along the path of God? And if you're walking along the path of God, then why should we be worried when things don't go the way we want them to? God is in ultimate control. But what do we begin to do? We begin to find faults. You know what? If they had did this, if this, had, this person had done this, if this person had said this, this person would have done this thing. We begin to find fault and find blame. And then we begin to place that pain. Because we're hurt. But what he says is, I created a hurt in you. Because here's the thing. If you ever notice when you have pain, you go to if you go to a good doctor, they try to find the root of that pain. You know, if you ever broken a bone and you really got injured, they are, it, it, it's swollen. They cannot do an x-ray. They'll tell you, hold on, come back. Why? Because you got to let the swelling go down. You got to let the swelling go down. We get so puffed up and so mad at the situation, you can't even begin to deal with the situation. Why? Because you're swollen. You know, I had, I had um, a friend of mine, he says, you know, when you hurt, don't do anything because you're still swollen. You're going to make the wrong decision. Don't make any decisions while you're swollen. You, you, am I making sense here? When we're hurt and in pain initially, we're swollen. We're bruised. And what the doctors do is wait for that swelling to go down. And then they'll look at it. And the, and the funniest thing about a break if you've ever broken a finger or, or a bone or anything like that, you know they have to reset that bone, right? Do you know how they reset that bone? Sometimes by like doing the same thing you did to break it. And the bad part about it is when you broke your arm or your leg or your finger, it happened so quick, you didn't have time to think about it until after it was done. But when they're sitting there and they pop your arm back in place, now you're having to watch them reposition your arm. Now that's a painful situation. That's what we go through. We have to sit here and watch God reposition us. Replace us back in the position where we're supposed to be. But some of us are just like a kid getting ready to get a shot. We're like, no. You ever, you ever, <laughs> you ever say something when you, when you get, ah, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, 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 give me a shit, give me a shit. I remember I, like, when I, when I, when I, <laughs> I remember when I got a tattoo, I was, uh, I was watching this lady get a, get her first tattoo, and she was like, have you started yet? And she was squinching and closing her eyes, and she was like, i And the, the, the place where I went to get tattoos, get a tattoo at, they wouldn't allow you, they wouldn't do a tattoo if you was drunk, intoxicated, or anything like that. So she kept trying to go get a drink. She says, can I have a drink? I need something to drink. I need something to drink. She says, well, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Can I just sit in the chair? And it was something. Can I sit in the chair until I fall asleep and then you start? <laughs> Why y'all laughing? That's how some of y'all act with God. <laughs> God. <laughs> I just let me just chill. You, God, let me just get some peace right now, God. Let me just chill right now. Let me just be okay. Give me peace. Wusa, wusa. God is like you got hell going around. You I ain't got time for your wusa. Okay. I mean, think about it. You're in the middle of a battle. Can you imagine being in the middle of a firestorm? I mean, you, here you are, SEAL Team Six, getting ready to bust in, and you talking about some wusa? You, your adrenaline should be pumping. 
We, it's not a wusa moment. It's a hua moment. You understand what I'm saying? But we, we want we want to be comfortable. We want the pain to go away. But one thing about pain, pain builds that that intensity. You know, sometimes you if you let pain be your motivator, because here's the thing about pain, and that I learned, pain makes me drive harder. It makes me go harder. You know why? Because I did not go through all this to get pain and get nothing out of it. You hear what I just said? I'm not going through all this to get nothing out of it. And if I turn around now, I'm leaving empty-handed. So I'm going to press my way and push my way and beat my way through until I get what God has promised me. And that's the thing. Paul put them in a situation where they had to fight and push their way through. And they, had, and they couldn't blame each other. They had to look within. And what, what the word of God is telling you is that what that pain does, it brings forth sorrow. But he says, I'm sorry that it may hurt you. No, he says, I apologize, but I'm really not sad about it. I was, but I'm not. Because, see, what it did, it did, the word did what it was set out to do. And that was correct you. Yes. Did you hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. You know, I was sitting there having a conversation with someone about heaven and hell and, 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 and discipleship. And I know they're like, he going to go there. And, 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 and I said, they, and someone asked me, they said, listen, so are you telling me if a person does not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, Okay, they're going to go to hell? Say, so, yeah. Pretty much. You know? And um, I know y'all like, why am I doing this? Like, I feel like something's wrong. And, uh, and, and they look like, that sucks. <laughs> That's not fair. That's kind of mean. But I had to be honest with them. And then, they, then I, they asked me, they asked me this question. They said, so, are you telling me a person, at what age is a person going to go to hell? Because kids can't go to hell. They don't know any better. I said, well, it goes back to the age of consent. We got to determine what the age of consent is when you're held accountable. Okay? But when you reach the age of consent, all bets are off. Now, my question is, always to people is if you know what you should do then why don't you do it? Amen. If you know how you should serve then why don't you serve? If you ask yourself one question and that simple question is this God am I serving you at the best and the maximum potential and ability that I have? And if your answer is immediately not yes, then what do you need to do? You gotta step up the game. You gotta be all in. You gotta be dedicated. And one of the problems that we have today is we are not dedicated. And it hurt. Can you imagine something? You get in that letter, and it's telling you that you, you ain't who you thought you were. You know, we hate to be told that we're wrong, don't we? You know, we hate we hate that. But see, here's the thing. And one of the things we do when, we, when we're told they're wrong, what do we do? We deflect. We deflect, and we end up talking about, well, I'm not as bad as, or it could be as bad as. Y'all ever heard, you ever catch yourself saying that? Mm -hmm. And God is saying, listen, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter as bad as. There are going to be a lot of people in hell that weren't as good as. Yeah, all right. Mm. Oh. Did you, are you getting what I'm saying? Mm. There are going to be a lot of people in hell that weren't as good. While you talk about I wasn't as bad as, God is saying, but you weren't as. If you want to go down there, you want to take that route. You know, I, 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 you know my daughter being a chiller is so funny. I always at the beginning of a new season when they make a new team, you know, people always want to complain about, 
why my child didn't get this position, why my child what is it on in the front, why my child is this, why my child isn't that. And then and it's so funny. Why my child didn't make this team? And I hear it so often. And it's like, my child, you got this child over here, and they can't tumble. My child can tumble. And I'm like, okay. Does your child show up on time? That ain't the point. No, well, that's my point. Well, your child may can tumble, but your child, but can, how are your child's jumps? You get what I'm saying? I mean, how are your child's motions? But they don't want to deal with it. They we want to pick and choose where we're righteous in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't fornicate. Okay. You don't fornicate because don't nobody want you. Yeah, yeah I said that. <laughs> nah, was that. Was that mean? I'm like, Paul, I apologize. No, I don't. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, if you ain't got temptation, well, you can't get mad at this sister, this brother over here who got it going on, and they struggling with it, but they got folk that, you know, when you when they walk into church, you looking like, my God, my God. You know, I'm, I'm just being honest. You ain't got that. So you don't have the same struggle they do. You, I, am I making sense here? Yeah. I'm not greedy. Well, I don't know if you're greedy or not. You broke. I mean, maybe that might be a reason why you broke because of the fact that you can't handle the money because you really do have a greedy demon in you. Yeah. Mm. Are, are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. But see, you don't know this because you're not dealing with it. You want to deal with everybody else's situation but yours. And you have a pain inside. That pain is only as an alarm telling you there's something not right in you. Hear what I said. If you got a problem with someone and you can't get past it, there's something wrong with you. Not them. I mean, I had to realize that. There's some people that God showed me that there are three people that vex my spirit. You, 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 like, you like the way I say that? Yeah. It sounds holy, don't it? It sounds it sound righteous, don't it? No, whatever it is. I, it, it, I'm going to break it down. Three people that I just don't like. <laughs> you know, but you try to sound holy. We try to cover it up with words. And he was like, you know what? You don't have a reason not to like things. God, look, these are the things that they've done to me. And he was like, you want to play that game with me? You want to play? You want to play that game? Let me tell you about the things you've done to me. See, and it's funny when God. We always look about what the things that other people have done to God, but it's a terrible thing when God turns around and says, "These are the things that you've done to me." Mm -hmm. Well, I haven't done anything to God. Do, do you talk to me on a daily basis? Do you study my word? Hey, who was the last person? Because I'm going to tell you, anybody here in sales? Y'all know a sales, anybody ever had a sales position? You know, I, I know I have. I'm going to tell you. So nobody else, y'all don't, don't like sales. Nobody here has done sales. Guess what? Did you know that being a Christian is a sales job? It's network marketing at its best. It's network marketing. Seriously. And it's a pyramid scheme, man. It is. Because at the top is God. <laughs> Are you following me here? And we're working our way to the top. And see, the only way you work your way in the network market, and network market is what? You got to bring people up under you, don't you? And when you bring them up under you, what do you have to do? You got to train them. Mm -hmm. And then what do you have to do? You, for you to be successful, you got to help them get other people, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And teach them how to train. Right. Oh, I think Christ called that discipleship. Okay, but we don't want to deal with that. We don't want to deal with the discipleship in that aspect. What we want to do is we want to let everybody else do it. You ever notice that? We want, we want everybody else to handle that. Well, God, I'm just going to go to church and I'm going to read my word, but I'm not going to, I can't be out there doing all that. You know, because see, and then, and, and, he, and, and the network market is so funny. It's so funny. You can't hide and say I don't brought people in, and they ain't got nothing to show for it. Because when you when you meet somebody new, what's the first thing you got to do to them? You got to bring them to the meeting. Mm -hmm. You know that. So what do you got to do? You got to bring them to church. You can't get mad talking about what you're doing. Get up at the at the, at the marketing meetings, all yeah, I got me some new focus, some new prospects, and you know I'm about, about to be a, a regional director and everything. And they're like, 
Ain't nobody here with you. You ain't never brought nobody. You ain't finna be nothing. You ain't turning nothing, no money, no reports, no nothing. You have nobody up under you. But the greatest thing, watch this about it. When you have people up under you, you get their residual. The greatest thing, when people up under you in the kingdom of God, you get that residual. God is looking at you. Look at what you did. Look at what you did. Did you know? See, I wanted you to reach that person because that's going to reach that person because that person just reached 10,000 people. And so because of you, you reached those 10,000 people. God writes that down. And see, here where we get mad. How they, you going to give them credit for 10,000 folk? And I, and they knew. Well, you need to get out there and get on your game and hustle. You need to find you a big fish, the big whale. It's a numbers game. And they're like, are you really saying this? Comparing discipleship and network marketing. Yes, I am. You want, want me to show you how it works? When Christ was here, before there was Christ, there was one person talking about him. His name was John the Baptist. He didn't have internet. He didn't have radio. And he wasn't writing anything. You don't believe me? Tell me one book John the Baptist wrote. Anybody. Don't know of it, do you? You just, you've read of people writing about him. You've never read anything he wrote. But here's another thing. After that, there was this guy called Jesus, who John talked about. Jesus then met 12 people. Okay? And then they, and what did he do? He took them two by two and told them to do what he's doing with them. And it's amazing how this one person that started in one area reached the whole world in less than a thousand years. And within that thousand years have had thousands of other denominations spin off from it, believing in him. With no radio, no TV, no social media. Okay? That's that word marketing at its best. We talk about the reason why you can't get things to go off the way you want because of things we don't do. We're talking about pain. What does that mean? Because I'm not going to hurt you right now. You don't pray. We don't pray like we should. We don't pray with intensity. We don't pray with integrity. We don't pray with expectation. We don't pray. I talked to someone the other day that said, you gotta, I told me you gotta preach your prayer life. I do pray. You do? Yes, I pray every night. I talked to somebody else, they told me they pray. I pray in the morning, I bless my food. That ain't it. Once again, if you're dating someone and the only time you call them is when it's time to eat, or better, the only time they call you is when it's time to eat. Or the only time when, and it's for you to feed them. Hear what I just said? Not for you to call them to come feed me, but they call you, listen, I'm hungry now. You know, how does it going to make you feel? Is that really them trying to get to know you? You be at dinner eating with them and they don't say a word. They tell you, thank you for the food. And then they don't say nothing, nothing else during dinner. Matter of fact, they don't talk to you about talk about you to nobody. So none of their friends know about you. Wow. None of their friends know you know that they, they say they love you, but none of their friends know that you that they, that you love them. Mm. Is, is anybody getting this picture I'm saying? They don't know. They don't know that. And you say that you're a believer, you say that you love God, you say all this other stuff. Really? Don't nobody even know. But yet at the same time, it goes back to hurt and pain. You get mad at everybody, but yet you say you have the love of Christ inside of you. Pastor Long said, he asked me to give a word, I said, oh, for God, I said, love. Love it. How can you say you're a child of God when you don't resemble him. Uh, think about what I just said. 
if you don't resemble him, I don't mean the way you dress and try to look like you holy. Because we're a covered mess. See, it's the time for us to stop. We can no longer cover sin. Amen. Okay? Amen. That, that past with Christ. We don't cover sin anymore. We go to him to eradicate sin. Yes. He, I didn't say erase it. I said eradicate it. Do you know why I didn't say erase it? Because see, erasing means that, okay, I'm doing this with the with, with the expectation of that I'm going to do it again. I said eradicate it. So that means that get rid of all that in your past, and we're going to get all get rid of all that in our future. With, with the mindset, are we in that mindset of eradicating sin out of our life? So what do we have to do here? We got to look at our pain. I can't get past my pain. Pastor, I hear you. I hear what Paul said. But all these things, I, I, I just can't do. I, you ha we handle pain the wrong way. Adam handled it the wrong way by hiding. Did you notice that? Where were you? Adam, where are you? I was hiding. Why? Because I was naked. Who told you? Because I see him. You know? Jonah handled pain. Uh, the way Jonah handled pain is the way most of us handle pain. We get secluded. We run away. You know? Think about it. We, when, when, we get, when we get hurt and we realize it's our fault, now if it's somebody else's fault, we quick to tell somebody else it was somebody else's fault. But when we really realize it was us, I don't want to be bothered. Leave me alone. Jonah was so mad with God. And he was mad with God because he had envy. Jonah was mad. Jonah was a perfect church folk, church person. God, you're going to let them get away with that, but you won't let me get away with nothing? God, you gave them another chance? God, you're sparing them? Really? We get mad. How are you going to let her get away? She's doing this and she's doing that. But yeah, I'm the one. God is like, dude, I'll let you hear. You're still living, aren't you? Are you not still living? Matter of fact, what your little simple-minded telling realize that I chose you to go talk to them. Out of all the other people, I chose you. We want to get mad at God, but God is saying, I chose you. That's enough to shout on right there. When God chooses you. Enough, I, I, I mean, think about it. Think of, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. When God chooses you, David, David had, oh, wow. David did the same thing. David handles pain. David, dealt, dealt, he dealt with it sexually. He became promiscuous with pain. Okay? And David also secluded. But David, that's how David dealt with it. Some of y'all, some of y'all, y'all deal with pain that way. You start dealing with different people and calling different people up. You, because you want them to pour into you, pour into you. And what does that do? That covers up your pain and makes you forget about it. In other words, you use foreign substances, whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, whether it be sex, whether whatever it is, you do it to cover up that pain and that hurt. So you can forget about it. Then, then there's Moses. Moses. Moses in pain. He get he got angry. Some of us get mad. We want to fight. We get hurt. We we want to bring pain on everybody else. And and, 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 and I mean he got so bad he struck, he struck the tablet. Really, Moses? This how you gonna go out? You gonna you, you so you gonna you gonna get mad about that thing? You know. We got Sarah. Sarah. Sarah does what a lot of people do. She played a blame game. She got mad. She was hurt because she was feeling some kind of way when she would do a her and Hagar. It was a fact that I think really believe Sarah had a problem internally feeling that she was being challenged of her womanhood, and she began to and she began to act some kind of way. And she began to blame. And look, what did she do? Because her faith was a strong. She told her husband to go sleep with the handmaiden. He did just that. They had the child. Then she gets mad. And then she turns around and blames the husband and said, because you slept with her, I'm getting treated like this. But you told me to. Really? See, see how we, ha we handle pain? Because she was hurt. Her pain made her angry and turned her to blame because she never once wanted to take deep inside and realize what was going on. But she had to face it. When the angel of the Lord came to her and told her and said, listen, you will bear a son. 
And what did she do? Matter of fact, she, he didn't tell her. He was, te he was telling Abram. And what happened? He said, your son's going to be called Isaac. Why? Because your, your wife over there laughing. So his name will be called Laughter. Be called Laughter as a reminder of where you are. And she had to grow from that. But then there's one person. One person who handled pain. And I love the way he handled pain. And in, in, in his, in his one verse said it all. He says, Though they slay me, though he slays me, yet will I serve him. Job. And he says in 6 and 10, this would be my comfort. I would even exalt in pain unsparing, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Job was the precursor to show us that it could be done before Christ even came on the scene. See, I'm, I'm just showing you. You know, here's the problem that we have. We always want to say as Christians, well, I, that's Christ. I'm not Christ. Well, I'm showing you a man of flesh and blood that wasn't the son of God. Okay? So it's eradicating all your excuses. And here's a man that was doing good. And God picked on him, chose him to have, this, have the devil go after him to prove to Satan that he loves him. Kind of like, just kind of like Jonah was shit picked up. But what did Job do? And Job had it even worse. Job had his wife. Man, you better curse God and die. You ever had people you going through hell and they just say, man, just give up, quit. It ain't worth it, dog. Let it go. Let it go, bro. Let it go. Quit. Let it go support that thing, bro. You know what I'm saying? I'm just being honest. I know when I, was, when I was singing, I was out in the world. Whenever I was going through, my friends just said one thing. They knew I didn't smoke weed, but they was like, man, that's why you need to go ahead and hit that thing, because all that thing ain't even worth it. No, I don't do that. Well, let's go get a drink. If you want a drink, let's hit the club. It, that's how we solved our, that's how we solved our problem, you know. I know y'all holy, y'all ain't never been like that. Y'all ain't never been like that. Y'all know nothing about that. But it's okay, yeah. I, you know. I was there. And the club solved all my problems, you know, or either it suppressed it. Now, you tell me which one it did, because the problem still came up every, every time. But Job turned around and he said, you know what? You done took my land. You done took my, my cattle. You done took my health. You done took my kids. You, done, you, you got my friends laughing at me and my wife telling me to get somewhere. My wife telling me to die. But yet he says, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to serve you. But finally, the one person that suffered all the pain was Jesus. Yes. And when I think, and we always say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, you know, my soul screams out, hallelujah, thank God for saving me. But I want you to understand, it ain't that that makes me scream. It ain't that that makes me shout. What makes me shout is to think of what God what he allowed his own son to go through just for us. And we had the audacity to complain about the things that we're going through. We had the audacity to get mad because how someone else is treating us. We had the audacity to get mad because somebody won't apologize, because somebody won't do this. This wars won't give us this then won't help us and get mad even with God when God don't move the way we want him to move on, talking man. about we feel that it was our faith no understand something your faith is the belief that God is not your faith is not the belief that God will do what you want him to do faith is the belief of knowing that God will do what is right Amen. That's it. Amen. what is right Amen. well what do you mean by that pastor it means this you might have your own agenda, but it ain't what God wants. So you sitting up here asking God to do this, and God is like, nope. 
no, 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 no. I remember when I was a young lad, I used to pray. I used to watch I Dream a Genie, and I would sit back and I would say, listen, I wish I just had one wish from a genie. I would just ask for as many wishes as I want. And I thought I was quite clever in wishing that. You remember when you thought you were smart, all your friends would ask to fly, and they would ask for money, and you, I'm going to be clever. I want as many wishes as I want. And, and, and I thought about it, and I remember asking, I want to win the lottery. And I remember asking, I wish I had some rich parents. And I, yeah, yeah, I, I know, I'm the only one that ever wished those kind of wishes. But I, 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 I realized that if there were things in my life that had went the way that I wanted them to go. I never would have met the man named Jesus. If I had got everything I wanted to get, I never would have appreciated what I have now. I would have been so out of position, or maybe even dead. I would have been in a, position, in a place that I don't even know where God would have been. I could have been stranded out, out of my mind. You know, I, I, I sat back and I remember when I was a young actor and I was doing my things, I wanted to become famous and I looked at it and I said, God, I'm good, they love me, I'm great. Why can't I be famous? Then I look at these actors and watch how their life goes. And he said, you could not handle it. I remember when I first started preaching and everything I touched turned to gold and I first started pastoring and I, I was like, God, I should have 3,000 people by now. He says, no, you shouldn't. Not yet. But you promised me. He said, I promised a prepared person that vision. Did you hear what I just said? I promised a prepared person that vision. You, son are not prepared. You can't handle it. Not right now. I gotta put you through some more. The reason that some of us can't move on, can't get elevated, because we have not strengthened ourselves. We are not prepared. Remember I told you, it's preparation. Okay? You gotta prepare yourself. Faithfulness is following the course for preparation, not just believing. Faithfulness is tending to the course even when you don't understand it. Faithfulness is being true to what God has told you to do, even when you don't see it benefits you. Are you dedicated? Are you all in? Are you, or are you still mad? I know what I said might upset some people. Good. It might have caused some pain in yourself. Good. But did it make you stop and look inside yourself and realize you're not who God created you to be? Then get right. You want what God promised you? then be prepared and be what God needs you to be for the promise he promised you. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us stand.